I'm on. It sounds like I'm on. Um, lovely to see you all. Thank you very, very much for making the inexplicable and possibly ill-advised choice of starting your GDC with the talk about death. Um, I, I appreciate it more than I can say, so thank you very much. Um, because that is what I'm here to talk about. So I call this the gamification of death, partly because I'm a little bit of a troll um, and partly because I couldn't think of anything better. Um, but I should probably say up front, I'm talking here about gamification, uh, not air quotes gamification. Um, and I don't really want to get bogged down into that debate. I think it's already unfolded quite interestingly at, at, at various of the summits earlier this week. Um, but I think it is worth just making that distinction between a process of trying to make something into a meaningful game, into something that operates in the way that we understand games work with risk and rewards and objects and constraints and whatever particular definition you best like as your definition of a game. And the other equally interesting but different process of using some of the language of games, some of the furniture and paraphernalia in terms of point structures and badges uh, to apply to other circumstances. Um, and both are interesting, but what I want to talk about today is the first one, is about this process of trying to make something real into a real game. So um, I'm going on the no air quotes front. And the thing I was trying to make into a game was death. Uh, and I and, and, and my team at Hide and Seek have spent on and off quite a lot of the last 18 months working on um, a project about death, uh, from which we learned a lot. Uh, and I wanted to come and uh, share that with you guys here. And this being GDC, I thought I should do that in the format of takeaways, because we all love a takeaway. That means something quite different in the UK, you know, it really skews our perspective of this whole event. Um, but yeah, I wanted to share my takeaways from that year and a half of working on uh, a game about death. And so these were my kind of top three takeaways. Uh, that was pretty much it. Um, it was a hard year and a half. <laughs> Um, and, it, you know, I, don't, I did tell you you were coming to a thing about death, and, uh, and I'm sorry that this is how your day starts. And it, it, it may sound like a major overstatement, right? Games about death, not that hard. Games have a lot of death in them. Um, we've all seen and played, and some of us have made probably really interesting projects, game projects, proper game projects about death, whether it, um, you know, some of Eric Zimmerman's early game design challenge sessions or playing Passage or The Path or, or whatever it is that you go to in your head when somebody says games about death. So why did this drive me to, to the brink of my takeaway slide when it seems quite straightforward? So it's worth saying that this isn't really a project about death. It's a project about a death. And that turns out to be a, a much harder thing. So this was a project that was based around this film, a film called Dreams of a Life. And this film tells a story that I still struggle to tell um, about the discovery of the body of a woman uh, named Joyce Vincent, uh, dead in her North London flat uh, in 2005. She was found by the bailiffs, who had broken in because of um, a buildup of unpaid electricity bills. And they found not her, but her skeleton. She'd been lying there for nearly three years. Despite the unpaid bills, the electricity had remained on. So for that entire period, her television had been on, um, broadcasting BBC One for all of that time. Um, her neighbors didn't know her. No one had ever reported her missing. Um, in the end, she was only identified, or formally identified, by comparing her, her teeth against holiday photos that they found in the flat in which she was smiling enough that they could um, make that secure identification. When she died, she was 37 years old. And it, it's a story that I think everybody, or everybody I've ever told it to, responds to very strongly. It's, it's unthinkable and horrible that somebody could fall through the cracks to that extent. And, and this was somebody who, who had friends, who had a successful career, who had family still living, who had a, a, a father still alive at the time of her death, and sisters. Um, it was briefly reported in the, in the UK press, but 
the, the story sort of went nowhere because nobody could find out anything about her. She, she dropped so far from kind of the, the way that we normally keep people in our social lives that, that nobody had any stories to tell. So Carol Morley, an acclaimed documentary uh, filmmaker uh, from the UK, just couldn't let the story go. And so she spent the next five years trying to uh, dig through what she could to try and find out both more about how Joyce had come to die, but also how she lived and who she was and, and what we'd lost in, in losing this woman that none of us knew or none of us knew had died. Um, the film was primarily funded by Film 4 in the, the UK, who you may know from Slumdog Millionaire and a bunch of other things that you might like. And they were really keen early on to make this a, uh, a commission that went beyond film. They, they, they knew that there is not necessarily an infinite market for people who go and see your house documentary, particularly at the cinema. There's often not opportunities for people to see that work depending on where they live and, and, and where the film is screened. Um, so they wanted to commission something to sit beside it um, that would be more accessible to a wider audience and that would provide an opportunity for people to explore their own reactions to the film um, and to Joyce's story. So they knew they wanted it to be digital and interactive, uh, which meant they basically knew they wanted it to be a game. Um, so they came to us and said, might you be the guys to do this? Now, if you, uh, you may or may not know hide-and-seek, if you do know hide-and-seek, that may seem like a weird thing, because quite a lot of what we do is silly. <laughs> quite, a, quite a lot of what we do has comedy swans in it and involves people running around in streets and reinventing um, clue, uh, clue so that it's got zombies in it and Monopoly so that it's about divorce. Um, and doing film work, but often film work for big entertainment projects like Sherlock Holmes or Green Lantern, as I'm sure you have clocked already. Um, but another half of our work that's maybe not so well known is with uh, more serious and kind of art house projects. Um, so um, Hinterland was a, was a playable poem that we ran on the streets of Edinburgh last year. Uh, we've made games with Tate Modern, uh, integrating with, with all of the artwork in their permanent collection, which in Tate Modern is a pretty eclectic and challenging uh, bunch of stuff. And we've done theatre projects and art projects uh, with various kind of national theatres. So Film 4 thought it would be a really great idea to involve us. We thought it would be a really great idea to involve us because this is the kind of stuff we like doing. And I thought it would be an especially good idea because I spent a lot of the last 10 years, some of you have been on the receiving end of it, talking about the potential of games, talking about their ability to uh, tackle any subject, to, to stand shoulder to shoulder with any other art and entertainment form and, and make things of worth and of weight. So I thought this was a brilliant idea. <laughs> it really wasn't. And, and it really wasn't because the minute you start poking at this, at this proposition, you start to find all kinds of really difficult constraints and challenges that, that um, affect how you approach the design. So in, in kind of no particular order, I thought I'd take you through a few of those just so you could kind of see how the thing stuck together in our head. So aesthetics is a, is a place to start. This is, a, this is a project that has to sit next to um, a, a film, a feature film. And, and not just any feature film, but a, but a documentary. And so we kind of very early on were asking those sort of um, big principle questions of, of what do we think this looks like? It, it, is it going to feel right if it looks like a video game? Is that going to sit well next to the film? Is it going to feel right if it is illustrated? Um, because while you have some fantastic animated documentaries, we had some questions about what happens when you put an animated game against a film documentary and, and whether or not you kind of trigger any interesting questions about kind of hierarchy of, of reality and truth in kind of those two things. And so we immediately found that we were kind of being led in interesting directions about what our aesthetic approach to this thing might be. Um, and part of the reason that's so hard is, as any of you who've ever worked in a film project know, is that timing is incredibly tricky, that you're probably trying to make a thing that needs to be ready for when the film comes out. That means you've got to start work before um, the film is finished. Um, and that's hard enough on a, um, a kind of blockbuster film where you can make a bunch of assumptions about how the thing will come out and probably where you know, you've got 
hundreds of versions of the script, assuming you can get hold of them to kind of see what's going to happen. And you can maybe even get on set for some of the shoot or see some of the production design stuff coming through. And, and those are experiences we've had before. With Carol's film, this is a documentary based almost entirely on interviews with people from her life, which meant that right up until the last minute, new information was, was kind of emerging and thinking about um, how the finished version might look. So when we started conversations with her, she had not made any firm decisions about how the film would appear. We knew there would be some moments of, of, of recreation of Joyce's life in it, but we didn't know at all what format they would take. And so both you have no access to that information, and you also probably have no access really to the creative team working on the film. This is a, this is a, you know, a, a, a low-budget passion project for a documentary maker. They are working 18 hours a day in Dublin on this stuff, um, and don't necessarily have a whole lot of time to work with you on the questions you have about how you want your game to look. Um, and that relationship with the film also gave us another interesting problem, um, which is the incredibly arresting thing about this project is the, is the story of Joyce and all of the questions that her life and her death trigger. Um, and that's where you want to start. But that's what the film is doing. That's what Carol is doing. Um, she's the documentarian. She's the, the person who spent five years um, immersing herself in, in every detail that she can find and building relationships with all of the, the, the people who did know Joyce, who were, who were willing to contribute. And for us to present our own version of that story, for us to make our own efforts to recreate Joyce's world, it seemed both like unnecessary duplication and also really a pretty substantial impertinence, right? This isn't, I make video games, I'm not a documentarian, I have no business rocking up to this and three weeks later going, hey, we made an explorable replica of Joyce's flat that we invented, you know, from not very much. So, although you, you, you want to start there because that's clearly the kind of the, the center of gravity of this whole thing, it becomes a very difficult place to be. And it becomes literally a very difficult place to be. I and mean, I, think, I think Film 4 had, had initially um, considered some approaches that included things like recreating uh, Joyce's flat as an apartment, as an explorable environment. And it's instantly <laughs> um, apparent that that's, that's kind of a... a, 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 a macabre and inappropriate thing to do because, because Joyce was there. Joyce's body was there. And either you have to include that in that replica of what you do, which is macabre and difficult, or you have to exclude it, which is sort of even worse. And finding a way to, to put you there that didn't feel intrusive and inappropriate um, was something that, that, you know, I think we, we very, very early on decided that we didn't want to do. So although Joyce was this huge starting point, um, we realized quite soon that she actually wasn't going to feature very largely in the work that we did at all, which leaves you in an interesting place. All of this, it's worth saying, is happening against um, what I think, to be fair, is probably the best funded art house transmedia digital game project ever, which is to say, you know, this is not a AAA title, right? This is, um, you're trying to do this within a, within a kind of very particular set of constraints. Um, but do work that's going to stand up credibly next to, to something designed to be seen on the big screen. But also because of the nature of that funding, you have a bunch of other really interesting uh, questions and problems. Um, Joyce's story uh, touches on some very difficult issues, touches on uh, issues of suicide, touches on issues of um, domestic violence, uh, at, the, at the time when we started working on this, it wasn't clear whether or not we were going to be dealing with issues of uh, drug use, uh, and obviously touches on this central issue of, of, of people who go missing, of what that process is and uh, what it can mean about the people who do go missing and what it means for the people who are left behind. And Film 4 is pretty fearless about tackling all of that stuff. They, 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 you know, they weren't looking to, to mark off any particular taboos for us but they have a very well-established set of compliance guidelines and some very well-versed lawyers who have a, you know, good guidelines and opinions about how you might tackle these things, about how you make sure 
that you don't include um, you know, uh, trigger points for uh, self-harm or where you have to think about putting in safety nets and contact points for people who might be having suicidal thoughts. And you very, I mean, these are, these are very sobering conversations, very, very fast, that you, that you don't necessarily have. There's also a whole bunch of legal issues here about um, questions of uh, um, libel, I guess, in terms of suggesting um, if there was kind of a, 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 any direct negligence that, that led up to Joyce's death and, and the failure to discover her body. Um, you know, because these are all, this only happened a few years ago. All of the people involved in this story are still alive. We're going to play this thing. Um, and so you're, you're very quickly aware that you're navigating in this, in this kind of very complicated space. And we got a lot of help from Film 4 in doing that. We spent a lot of time talking to people like um, Missing People, which is the big missing persons charity in the UK, to, to try and kind of get our heads around all of these issues. Because the problem with a project like this is it's not just about keeping the lawyers happy. It's really a lot about not being an asshole. This, because you hear the story, and everybody has their own immediate reaction to it, and I think quite a lot of people had a reaction. I certainly had a reaction where you go, oh, God, I should ring my brother. I've not spoken to my brother in, like, three months. That's inexcusable. I should fix that. I should do that. I should call my granny. I should do this thing. I should, you know, bang on my neighbor's door and introduce myself because I still don't know their names or whatever it is. And you very quickly start having ideas about how you might structure a, a game experience that revolves around doing those kind of things. Um, and possibly revolves around doing those kind of things in machine-readable ways. So you start to have overexcited ideas about scraping people's Facebook accounts for a whole bunch of information about the, 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 you know, the size and richness of their friendship group. And, and looking at how often they contact people and prompting them to get in touch with people that they haven't contacted for a while and all this kind of thing. And then you realize that you have no business doing that. You have no idea who these people are. The, the, the machine-readable portions of their social lives are only ever portions. And none of you have lives that are fully and wholly represented in Facebook or on Twitter or whatever it is that, you're, that you tend to be. There's people who are there. There's people who are not there. There's maybe people who... Um, are there who it looks like you never interact with, but that's because you see them every day or you I am them every day or you know whatever else is going on and trying to reconstruct a, a, a true reflection of somebody's degree of connectedness from digitally scrapable sources. The, again, the minute you poke at it for more than two seconds is, is clearly not a good idea. Even if you remove the machine readable portion and just say, how long is it since you, you know, called your mother? you may have a really good reason for not having called your mother. I have no business, my game has no business telling you that you ought to do that. And what, what you find is you, you, so you step away from that specificity um, and you, you try and find something that is gentler and more open to interpretation and then you end up with something that is so wishy-washy and so vague that nobody cares. It's like, hey, maybe you should think about a thing that, that you don't think about if you'd like. It's not like, you know, that's not, that's not hooky. That's not, that's not kind of what you want. So that, you know, that became really important to us. And I think particularly when we talk to people like the, the, the Missing People Charity, you start to realize lots of things that I, I hadn't perhaps thought about before as much as I should, that, you know, sometimes people go missing because they want to go missing. Sometimes people are isolated because they enjoy solitude. They're happy working that way. That, that, that it, sometimes people like mediating nearly all of their friendships and social life digitally, and that doesn't mean there's anything deficient in that. It doesn't mean there's anything deficient if you don't want to do anything digitally and you want to do everything down the pub in real life. You, you, it, was, it was very difficult to find any firm ground of a thing that we felt we could say that didn't involve being an asshole. And that led into another realisation that, that really affected kind of the development direction of the project. The... One of the saddest things at the heart of Joyce's story is she was found by accident. No one, no one knew she was there. No one was looking. Um, her neighbor had become a bit frustrated the previous year at the noise from the television and had banged on the wall a bit, but when it hadn't worked, we'd given up. Um, and, and that felt incredibly important to me, that this, this reality that 
this terrible thing had happened, and we just didn't know, and, and nobody did anything, and nobody was looking, and there, there was no sense of quest, there was no sense of mission. It was a really interesting thing to take into a game design context, because so often that's our structure. I mean, arguably, it's always our structure, that there's a thing you're trying to do, there's a point you're trying to get to, there's, a, you know, there's some kind of mission statement or, or a goal objective. And, you know, obviously we didn't want to do crass ways to do that. We would, uh, I don't think we would have felt at all comfortable kind of making a game where your job was to save Joyce or, you know, find her earlier or, uh, you know, whatever that could have been. But even if you make it oblique, it just started to feel um, tonally and thematically wrong, putting you in a structure that was about going, hey, you know, your job is to, is to do this stuff and that will work, just felt to, to be a structure that was everything that the film and Joyce's story wasn't about. And it was probably about this point that we started to get quite scared because <laughs> it's like, okay, so now, now we can't even kind of have that structure. So we're not, we're not going to use Joyce's narrative. We're not going to use that kind of conventional game mission structure. And then the difficulty is, even when you start looking on a systemic level, it's really difficult. So a lot of, and certainly a, a lot of the work we've done in, in gamifying with no air quotes things, and a, a lot of what the other people have done, is, is looking for those essential systems, is looking at how you boil something down to something revelatory and interesting about the kind of interplay of, um, of key elements within that system. And that's great because games thrive on those structures. But I, mean, I think this is interesting because we've, we've talked here often enough about you know, whether or not it's a realistic goal that we'll ever be able to model the, the, the muddier elements of the human condition in that kind of a way. And Joyce's story just seemed like you know, this incredible object lesson in how functionally impossible that is. The, the, the systems... There are systems that sit under Joyce's story, all kinds of systems. There's administrative and institutional systems. It was clear that, or it became clear from, from Carol's research that the, there was some history of, of uh, domestic violence there and that had put her into a system which had um, provided her with safe housing but had probably broken her connections with the places that she'd been living prior to that happening. Um, there's terrible administrative details um, that come to light. She, she had gone into hospital uh, a few months before she died and had listed on her hospital admission sheet as her next of kin, her bank manager, which is still one of those things that kind of wakes me up at night occasionally. Um, you know, and then there's, there's all kinds of social and friends relationship. Again, it's clear. I do, if, you, if you have a UK iTunes account, you can download Carol's film. It's not released in the, in the US yet, and it's, it's great, and it is also not as doleful as it sounds. It's surprisingly life-affirming. Um, but you, you can definitely map a bunch of you know, friends there of a, you know, this friend who was jealous, and this friend who had a secret crush, and this friend who rejected her. There's a whole bunch of kind of professional stuff about where her career took her and, and, and financial concerns. There's some kind of systems that underpin... Um, her upbringing and, and, the, and the, the, the questions kind of of the, of the history of, of race and racial, preju racial prejudice in London. And all of these things are so knottedly interconnected and produce these imperceptible, unpredictable, longitudinal, contradictory changes and effects on each other that even if we could make any kind of statement on how that had played out in Joyce's life, which we obviously can't, the thing is just a mess. The thing is not navigable um, as a system. And you're left with this choice of, of you can boil it down, but then you boil it down to something that's reductive and misleading, or you can leave it confusing. And then it's just terrible game design because you have no idea why anything is happening or what's affecting what or what kind of meaningful choices you're making or all the rest of it. And, you know, reminder, <laughs> this whole massive thing is to be delivered as a super accessible film four project that's going to um, attract a new audience to this thing. So our, our kind of goal was to, to make sure that people who found, who maybe even hadn't kind of converted to Facebook gaming yet, would find something here that they were comfortable dealing with audiences who weren't necessarily already gamers. So while I started saying we were trying to make a game about death, um, we were really trying to make this game 
Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and we took a swing at that, right? Because we'll, we'll give it a go. That seemed like a thing that we, that we might try to do. So we, we turned quite early to text. Text seemed like a really interesting starting point for a thing to, you know, to solve some of those aesthetic problems, to solve some of the budget problems, um, to solve some of the tonal problems. Um, and we thought we could do something interesting and uh, hopefully meaningful for people by kind of drawing on a bunch of interactive fiction traditions, looking a bit at kind of... Uh, text adventure design and graphical text adventure design and, and thinking about, oh, we were so pleased when we came up with this, thinking about if we could create this environment that may or may not be graphically represented that you navigated in the way that you navigate a text adventure, broadly speaking, so you're moving through a sequence of rooms or spaces. Um, and that would present you with um, versions of the kinds of puzzles and challenges that you're maybe familiar with from text adventures. So there are locked doors, there are characters perhaps who won't let you pass, there are, 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 are things to navigate. But rather than giving you the kind of tools that often those games give you of, of you know, candles and bits of rope and keys and all the rest of it, we would ask you to draw those from your own life. So there would be a, a room where to move on from that room, you would need to leave something behind that was you know, an object that was precious to you or... Um, a door, probably wouldn't have been a door, that would only open if you would tell it the name of someone you never told you loved and you wished you had, or whatever it was, maybe a bit less terribly mawkish than that. And then the process of puzzle solving would be the process of, of reuniting and restructuring those things and hopefully finding some interesting perspectives on, you know, on, on how those things work together. So you would move through this space and, you know, in the end, make progress, not by unlocking the blue key with the blue door, but in the end by, you know, giving your grandmother's engagement ring to the to your high school crush or whatever unresolved thing we had uncovered, uncovered in the course of doing that. And we thought that this whole thing might play out. The big reveal at the end would be that in the choices that you'd made in navigating this space, you were actually navigating on this map that told you something about yourself in terms of where you situated yourself on, on that grid, in terms of whether you were somebody who um, gravitated to crowds or liked your solitude or uh, uh, was somebody who was kind of more digitally or physically native and then that might be a thing that we could kind of map and take out to the world as a whole as kind of something that had arisen from this game. There's a lot about that idea not to like. Um, quite a, you're probably sitting there cataloguing a lot of those things right now. I mean, certainly, I don't think there's any kind of great discovery at the end of that to find out whether you like being alone or not, or whether or not you're on the internet often. I suspect you can probably self-diagnose on those counts quite well. Um, and also, we started realizing that there were a bunch of problems in uh, giving you that kind of progression structure that... Um, even within uh, a game that has no overt winning, that has no kind of great statement of purpose or sense of potential failure, the minute you sense that your progress is being gated or that one thing or another thing is going to happen depending on what you do, when we started paper prototyping this, we found that it, it, it totally colored people's responses to questions that we hoped they would feel able to respond to truthfully, honestly. You know, the, the, the thing that I, uh, I really liked about this structure was there's this kind of confessional space that you form between the player and the game, and the, and the game is, a, as, is, is an inert and anonymous um, repository of, 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 of these kind of confessions and information. But the, the minute you know there's kind of two ways forward and you're being asked something, you're second-guessing the game. You're wondering what you should say, what's going to happen to this. You become incredibly self-conscious. And we, we really struggle to kind of find a way beyond that, which took us to Chartres. Um, this is the, the labyrinth in Chartres Cathedral in France. We didn't actually get to go there. There's a floor cloth replica in North London. It's pretty good. Um, costs a fiver to get in. That's the weird thing. It's like going on a fairground ride. You have to queue up and give a, give a lady your money at the front. Um, so you guys will all know this. I didn't know this because I hadn't been paying attention. Labyrinths, mazes, very different things. Mazes are puzzles. They have choices. You can get lost. Labyrinths are only ever one continuous line. There is no choice. 
There is no possibility to get lost. You just walk along a wiggle. And that seemed like a kind of interesting thing that you have a kind of more traditional game experience, something with an implicit challenge and a possibility of um, failure and a series of choices, and you have something that's a classical linear structure. And should be boring, therefore, right? We're, we're a GDC, we're a bit snooty about linear. We like interactive, we like choice, we like challenge. Walking one of these things blew my mind. I don't know, has anyone ever done it? Has anyone ever walked Labyrinth? You, you guys are great. So I, maybe I just like ha was having a bit of a day, but this whole weird thing happens that all you do is you, is you go in one end and you walk to the middle. And the middle is like five yards away. And you know how far away five yards away is. It's just over there. You know how long it's going to take you to walk there. It's going to take you five seconds. You know the direction that you're going to walk to get there because it's just over there. Except now suddenly you don't. Now you have no idea how long it's going to take you to walk five yards. You're walking along this path. You don't know where you are. The, your sense of space and time have effectively dissolved. You meet somebody coming the other way, but you don't know if they're coming the other way. They might be going on the same journey as you, but they're just at a different point state. And if they're on a different point state, you don't know whether they're ahead of you or behind you. And so suddenly that made me feel, and that's kind of before you get to all of the kind of experiential choices of just how you act within that space and, and what you do with yourself. So we got kind of excited about linear stuff and thinking about whether we could use that as a way to diffuse some of these uh, questions about how to get more um, pure responses from people in terms of uh, the questions that we, the issues that we wanted to think them to think about and the questions we wanted to put to them. But we did just keep hitting up against this problem that the minute there was any sense of completion or goal, um, we felt like we were losing people's ability to be honest. So we played around with that for a bit. We played around a bit with the notion of not setting a win condition, but setting a big number of win conditions. So kind of approaching this in a more simmy way. So rather than saying, hey, there's this puzzle or a structure or a space that you have to get to the end of, see if you can get that right, go, okay, you can adopt a bunch of different personas and move through this space in different ways. So try and make you know, the right set of decisions for somebody who's alone. It kind of also gets us out of the being an asshole problem where we're not telling people there's a right way to do it. Let's go, so successfully navigate this space as a loner, successfully do it as a, um, you know, as a parent, successfully do it as a whatever those kind of personas would end up have being. That kind of worked a bit as a bit of game design, but it made us really sad because it loses the player being the player. What I really liked about the intensity of that relationship between the player and the game was that was you were you. I like making games where you are you. Uh, and that seemed to kind of uh, dilute that to a point where it wasn't interesting anymore. Another option you have is make it so that the player defines the win conditions. Go, hey, we're not going to be judgmental. We're not going to tell you how to live your life. We're going to let you say what it is that you care about or you're aiming for. Again, the problem is the minute you... Um, overtly ask somebody that question, even if it's in an automatic way, they don't tell you what they think, they tell you what they think they're supposed to think. And it's incredibly difficult to find a structure that lets people actually answer honestly in those circumstances. And then we thought that maybe reflecting the, the insights that we'd had about a kind of mission and quest structure being inappropriate for Joyce's story, we would secretly not have a winning condition. So we would set you up in a, in a structure where uh, you thought you knew what you were doing, you had a bunch of stuff to keep you busy that you were kind of chewing through, and at the end of it, we would go, oh, no, but look, while you were busy doing all of that stuff, you really lost, because there was this other thing going on that we didn't tell you about, that you didn't know about, that is sad. <laughs> and then I'm an asshole again, right? That's terrible game design. Um, so uh, there was this kind of... I, I don't have sound for this, but there should be like the sound of massive stone slabs dropping onto bleak, rocky ground. Of just thinking, you know, we really tried, but we couldn't find a game that, that, that fit within those things that we talked about. And, and that really kind of shook me because I have long campaigned on the principle that games, you know, really can do anything. So, we did something clever. We made a thing that wasn't a game. <laughs> um, and that thing is, is dreamsofyourlife.com if you want to go and have a look at it after this. 
And it worked, hooray, great news, everything. Okay, we made a pretty good thing that isn't a game. So we worked with a, uh, an amazing novelist called A.L. Kennedy, who, if you don't know, you should check out, who turned out to be a secret expert on all kinds of um, really interesting sort of Stanley Milgram experiments and Barnum statements and psychic codes and stuff that turned out to be an incredibly useful way to try and structure the text of what we wanted. We worked with this amazing photographer, Lottie Davis, whose work you are seeing, um, who helped us think about how we might find a way to photographically represent some of the issues that we, that we wanted to um, tackle. Um, and we made something that's, that's been pretty well received, um, that we're super proud of, and that, that we think stands effectively next to the... Um, film. So I should be thrilled, right? I should be, this, this session should have a different title. Um, but I'm not, because it wasn't a game, and I really wanted to make a game, because I like making games, and I wanted to find um, a resolution to that. And the thing is, uh, it's possible that all that happened was just those constraints that I took you through were just too crazy. They were, they were just too nested, too many of them. We just boxed ourselves into a corner. The fact that we couldn't find a solution to it doesn't say anything about games. It just says that we'd, that we'd overcooked our design process. But the thing that makes me less sure about that is this isn't the first time this has happened. Um, this is a process that, that is now becoming fairly familiar to me. So we, um, we did an awesome secret, genuinely secret laboratory project that I can't tell you about because I'm still NDA'd last year that was working with a, a scientific institution that was looking to uh, improve its energy usage. Uh, and, and go greener. And uh, one of the things that was preventing it from doing that is they have these huge block of climate control rooms in which they run experiments. And they felt that they were probably using that really inefficiently, and was there a game that we could make that would um, motivate and reward scientists for doing a better job of um, combining experiments and, and finding ways that they could share those rooms and use them better. And we couldn't find one. Um, because the minute you set a bunch of game objectives and game rewards on top of that system, you distract them or divert them from the already completely important set of goals and constraints that they have in the work that they do. Can we make a really awesome tool that makes planning this stuff more fun, that is really impactful in terms of improving their energy use, that draws on a whole bunch of stuff I've learned as a game designer? Absolutely, but it wasn't a game. Look, it says so and everything. Science, okay, what about, if it's not secret laboratories, what about, what about this? So this is a thing we did last year as part of the Green Lantern um, campaign, uh, which I really like. It was a nice thing. Um, Green Lantern, you know, all about his green ring, space battles, bad acting. Um, and we wanted to do something maybe a bit more interesting with it than, than just do a bad org, although we did a little cute org as well. Uh, so we hooked up with these guys. This is the Milky Way Project. You may know they're scientists who operate out of Oxford. They get real people to look at... Mm, uh, these are pictures from the NASA Spitzer Space Telescope that haven't yet been classified because there's billions of them and there's not enough grad students. Um, and just get real people to look through them and see what they can see. Uh, and what they're looking at at the moment in... Uh, the bit that we hooked up with is, uh, is the birth of stars. When stars are born, they explode. Um, there's a pressure wave that sends out uh, a globe of gas and debris around the exploding star. When you take a photograph of that, you see it from the side. What you see is a ring. And in the photos, they colored them in green. So suddenly, I have all of these photos of green rings in space um, that NASA need people to look at just before the Green Lantern movie launches. So I think that would be a nice thing to do. So we hooked that into the, the stuff that we were doing. But those guys who are really smart already know you can't put game objectives on top of this observation process, that the minute you set people goals, the minute you say, how, many, how fast can you classify 10 things? How many green rings can you find? Any of the kind of obvious structures that you might go to to make a game of it corrupts the results, changes the, uh, loses the veracity of what, uh, of what people do. So they have a lovely slick system. There's a, there's a nice air quotes, gamification process gone on here in terms of giving you level rewards and giving you a sense of progression and a sense of your place in the community, but it's absolutely not a game. Um, 
And then the same thing happened with another secret music project I can't tell you about, which was about looking at what we could do with gaming around listening habits. And you, I mean, it's interesting, this hits a, the same thing, but a, another element of the, of the same thing, which is there are games you make where the game places a value on the music that you listen to. So either we do something that judges the music that you listen to and says, well, this band is worth more than that band because they have a higher chart position or they've sold more records or they have more likes on Facebook or however, or because we think they're better or however we draw that data from. Or we can do a thing that says the more you listen to this, you know, so I don't know if any of you played Song Summoner on, on your iPod back in 2007, uh, which is a, a lovely little Square Enix RPG where your characters are built from songs on your iPod and the more you listen to that song, the more kind of that character levels up. That's a simplification, but the key point is the more you listen to that piece of music, the more powerful you are in the game. But Music is this incredibly important thing in people's life. The game doesn't know if you, if you just got dumped or you just got a new job or you're going on holiday. I mean, I find playing those games where my listening habits are impactful in the game that I'm playing just makes me hate music. You just get up in the morning and go, oh, God, I've got to put that thing on, on repeat for 10 listens. Otherwise, I won't get my, you know, spangle when I log in. And, and I don't... I think, I think there are things you could do. I, I don't really want to do them because I think I'm ruining people's relationship with music and that's not a nice way to spend your life. So, what does this prove? It might prove this. And I'm aware that I've kind of taken a risk of standing up in a room full of game designers and going, this is an impossible game design challenge. Nobody can solve this. And you guys already probably have notebooks full of ways to solve it. Um, so I might just be rubbish at it. You know, I'll take that. If anybody has better ideas for what we could have done, I would love to hear them. You know, I, I would love to see this problem solved. So, you know, by all means, pepper me with those. Um, you know, but it is worth saying that I, I worked with a bunch of smart people on this and we tried really hard and we, we came up blank. And, and maybe that tells us something important, which is maybe this is just really hard. Um, maybe, it, you know, it's okay that we, that, that in the time that we've been spent trying to, bolt games into the real world in interesting and in, in important ways that we haven't completely cracked it yet. But there's this other thing, which is the scary thing, which is maybe this just doesn't work. You know, I, the reason I love making games is I see them transform people in this incredible way. The, the, the great delight for me in moving from working on digital games to also working on, on, on games in the real world is you see face-to-face -face people do things they never would have thought they uh, could do or... Uh, you know, become kind of characters that you, that you wouldn't otherwise have, have, have thought they were. Um, but it feels so much to me that the reason games manage to accomplish that has an awful lot to do with the fact that the constraints that games set up are temporary and arbitrary. That, that's what makes them so powerful. And the minute you bolt those structures onto something that is real and enduring and ongoing, there just is a tension. There, 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 it is hard to do the things I can do in games that, that don't have to sustain that, that structure um, that moves against it. So this is, the, you know, this is kind of where I, I hit that, that we, might, we, we may have a problem here. Um, or certainly a problem that I didn't kind of immediately know how to solve. So, I, you know, low point. I, I, I refer you back to my takeaway slides of going bollocks, what do I do now? And I have, um, I couldn't fit all of this into an hour, so I have some terribly highfalutin kind of um, attempts at structures that I, I don't think do work that anyone has never done before, but, but may be useful in terms of when you're approaching one of these projects, figuring out what it is that you, um, uh, what, what kind of uh, structures you might want to use. But in the end, I, I, it isn't actually what I wanted to talk about today. I don't think that's what's interesting about today. What I wanted to do was come and be honest about a real project that presented these kind of real challenges. Because in the end, I don't feel nearly as bad about this as I expected to. It is all okay. I think mostly I've realized what's happened is that, and this maybe says more about me than anything else, I guess this was kind of previously my conception of games. Games could go anywhere. Games could do anything. Games are unstoppable. And that, that was what excited me about them. That I felt like there was this huge new potential that, that we were only just beginning to explore. Now, I think games are more like that. 
Um, I don't know how many of you um, played Shadow of the Colossus, but um, aggro's a much subtler and more sensitive creature than the horses in Skyrim. Um, he can't go everywhere. He has his own idiosyncrasies. He's wonderful. Um, I care far more about him in the end than I do about any of the Skyrim horses that I rode over cliffs. Sorry, Skyrim horses. Um, and I think that's great. That's, that's, uh, you know, I think, I think if we start to butt up against hard edges of things that games can't do, that shouldn't depress us about games. That shouldn't make us feel that, that, that games have failed to make a case for why they ought to be allowed to stand shoulder to shoulder with anything and everything else. But they should um, delight us that we're starting to get a sense of what it is that makes them special. That, that, we're, that we're zeroing in on what it is that um, games can do that other things can't do. And then you take another swing. So this is, we're, we're taking another swing. This is a South by Southwest. This is, this is the live game version of our game about the lady who died in a flat, uh, which we think might work, which is another different approach. Again, probably not a game, but I've loved having a chance to take another swing at it, to take what I learned from the last one and come back uh, and do this. And you know what? Um, also this, that here we are at GDC again, and I think a lot of us have this experience, that you slog away for a year at this project that, whatever it is, probably has you close to tears at times, and you forget there's all these awesome people who can help, and who are already doing this, and who already know this stuff. And I think um, it's been really nice being here, having, having written this talk in the dark days of the end of last year to, to come here now and see everyone and start having conversations and start hearing about the other projects that we heard about um, at the summits yesterday and that we hear about in the rest of the week that start to find other solutions to these problems and start to show ways in which we can refine our understanding of the, the theory and, and prove out those assumptions in practice um, in a way that uh, kind of resolve all of that. So, ha, got you. Not the, not the bleakest session ever, I hope. Um, I wanted to leave quite, as we've kind of got 10 minutes for questions because I kind of thought people would want to shout at me and tell me that we'd missed a really obvious thing we could have done that was great. So we kind of um, got 10 minutes. I can talk more about anything you would like me to or, or kind of more about structures that we use in this work. So far away, if you've got anything. We'll, we'll go left, stage left, stage right. Hi, uh, thank you for a great talk. Um, I uh, last fall made a game uh, that uh, was kind of a documentary game about uh, some soldiers uh, accused of war crimes, and I faced a lot of sort of similar challenges to I'm what you sure. faced, and ended up with something that I sort of didn't feel comfortable calling a game. Um, uh, something that I'm sure also, you faced that was a big challenge was even convincing someone to try a thing like that because when I would say that sentence, a lot of people would just immediately sort of like eyes glaze over, back up, no, that doesn't sound like something I want to do. So whether it's a game or not, when you have a sort of interactive thing exploring this like very serious issue that sounds like it's going to be a huge downer, what do you think are ways to get people to like take a chance on playing something like that? So I, I'm honor bound to repeat the question so that it goes on the tape, the question of, of how you get people to approach games that are about this kind of super serious subject that aren't necessarily very appealing. We try to work in two things on that front for this. So the actual front door to this project is a Facebook quiz, which is funny and social and lightweight, but just starts to dig into kind of some of those slightly darker questions. Again, I can link anybody out to that who wants it. Um, and that has a little kind of link through at the end that goes, oh, okay, so you seem really interesting. You should come and have this conversation over here. Um, and I think the people who played that had a pretty positive expression, uh, experience with it, but you just hit the problem then of how you market that thing and how you get that noticed on Facebook. And the other thing is these photos that you've, that you've seen and that you'll see if you play the experience, there's a, a time-lapse animation that spits out every day from the game. The game? I've given up not calling it a game. What, you, what am I going to do? Um, so everybody who plays everything they do every day, the, the choices that they make and the, and the routes that they take through this thing um, are logged and then are used to recreate a kind of uh, unique edit of that thing, which doesn't show anything personal that they said or anything individual about them, but we hoped would become a little kind of shareable thing because it takes a minute and it's pretty to watch. 
again, that probably didn't have quite the impact that we were hoping to do, but I think you're exactly right. You've got to think about how you bring people to this kind of work, whether or not it ends up being a game. Uh, right. Before you'd resigned yourself to uh, this not being a game at all, uh, were there any other games that you looked at for inspiration or that you thought had sort of blazed that trail before? And, and if so, uh, what were they? I mean, I think we were looking at all kinds of stuff. I mean, we've, we've ended up doing quite a lot of projects about death over the last year and a half. So, so we, we contributed to the... There's uh, a big art centre in London that ran a festival of death this year, and we did talks there on, on death in games. Um, uh, and there's, I mean, pages, pages and pages and pages of stuff. And then also a, a, a whole range of things that aren't necessarily uh, about death, but are about subtleties in this stuff. Um, so I don't, I don't think we're at all trailblazing. I don't, uh, you know, I, I don't want to uh, come off as thinking that we're the first people who ever faced this stuff. Um, but I think this, uh, often the, the projects that I knew and that I looked at were, if they were about death, tended not to be, they're often very personal, but they weren't documentary. And so that, that kind of limited their usefulness because they often got to do things that we couldn't get to do. And I now can't give you a really good list, but um, I can afterwards if you ask me. Sorry. Oh, and I forgot to repeat the question, which is, did we look at any other games? That was probably obvious from my answer. We'll do left and then right. Uh, yeah, so I hesitate to use the word appeal, but it seems like a part of the appeal of this project is that this was a real person. And so you've, you're kind of morbid, almost kind of fascination with it. Do you think you would have taken a different kind of creative direction or found game mechanics that would have made, more, made it more gamey had it been a fictional person that you created? Would you maybe not been so, I guess, reverent about it? And do you think it would have affected you know, the outcome for better or worse? So question here, would it, would it have been an easier project if the person had been fictional? Oh, my word, yes. You know, I think... I mean, I, and I think reverence is a, is, a, uh, is a fair word there. I think there is, is maybe a fair comment that we were overly sensitive about these issues. You know, this is, this is the first project I'd done like this. I think one of the things that you face as a documentarian is developing your own practice about how reverent you're going to be, about, about uh, how, uh, how much you wear kid gloves when you handle this stuff. And we may, be over, we may be over worried about that. I think because we also had this nested thing, which it wasn't just what could we do with Joyce's story, but it was, we also had to be respectful of what Carol was doing with her film, and we ended up at kind of two removes from that content. Had it been our own fictional person, we would have had a lot more freedom, but we also would have had a lot less impact, right? The, the, the thing that gets you in the gut about Joyce is it's true, it happened. This is a, you know... You can't walk past that block of flats in, in, in North London now without knowing that unfolded there. So, easier, but maybe less powerful. Thank you. Uh, so, first of all, thank you for an amazing talk and for um, your capacity to sort of reveal the creative process. It's very informative, so awesome. Thank you. In listening to what you were talking about, I am unclear where exactly you guys hit the wall. Can you talk about um, your expectations around agency and or appeal? Because it felt to me as you were discussing that, that maybe where you hit was having a particular expectation around that that may have conflicted with, like we were talking about, the need for reverence. I, I think, so the, the question is, where did we hit the wall and was it around the question of agency? It's a fair pricey. And yes. I mean, yes, a lot. I, th I think, oddly, probably one of the things that hurt us on this project was our background in designing real-world games, that I've seen those be so transformative. And I've absolutely seen those be, I've experienced those being revelatory, where you find yourself doing something or say something that you never would have thought you would, but is actually a truer expression of who you are than if you'd had time right. the way you normally do in life to compose your reply and present the front that you want to present. And I was, I was definitely chasing that. I was really hoping that, that I could do that. But I, I couldn't find the bait and switch that you need to do there, which is I need to get you thinking that you're doing something else and focus your agency and, and focus maybe the constraints or the time pressure or the competition or whatever it is that's going to force you to, to, to reveal those things within this context and, and, and uh, truthful structure. And God, I wish we could have, because I think that could have been incredible. But... I think, I think what we have accomplishes the, um, the emotional 
goal that I set for the project, but through different means, through non-game means, and I would love to have got there through games. Um, I, I want to start by saying uh, I think you might be selling yourself short a little bit. Um, it, it sounds like a really hard problem. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I wanted to, to ask, it, you mentioned a couple of times with the astronomy and with the, the, the music game uh, that sort of adding a game mechanic kind of screws up the experience. Um, and I, I wonder if that might be because there's already a game mechanic there and that game mechanic is sort of a part of life and we just we don't know what that is so the question is does it do, do these is it hard to do these projects because there's already mechanics in place that then conflict with the game mechanics yeah i mean i, I don't think they're necessarily game mechanics they're they're just mechanics there are a whole bunch of systems that drive the choices that you make in relation to these things and i think i have a whole i have like hand signals now for how i try and think about these things that you know, we're always chasing the game of, like, make this thing, make this thing into a game. And that that transformative approach is not necessarily right. And that, and that sometimes there's... It's interesting looking at, at, at kind of two... Fe this is oversimplified, but kind of two fields. You've kind of got the... Um, the subject and the narrative of the, and the context of the thing that you're working with. And then you've kind of got its rules and objectives and interactions. And often where these projects don't work well is when you, you try and stack everything on top of those. You're going to go, well, stay in that context and we'll work with those interactions and objectives and we'll try and put a game on top of that and we'll just... Arr! And it doesn't work very well. And there are often much more successful approaches where you, you turn one of those through 90 degrees. You go, okay, so we'll look at those objectives and actions and mechanics, but we'll actually just change the context. We'll, you know, this is maybe a game about saving energy, but we'll tell you that it's about parrots, or we'll tell you that it's about space aliens, or whatever. And that's something you see quite often, and there's, a, there's kind of a good reason for that. that. That helps release that tension. Or you do it the other way and go, yeah, we will keep you in the context and the narrative of this topic, but we'll change the things that you're worrying about. We'll maybe invent completely new fictional ones that aren't actually about any kind of real-world behavior change. Or, or you kind of separate both. And, and I mean, this is the thing, you know, I, uh, where I ended up with is, with games, I can make a, a game that uses your listening habits that I have a bunch of problems with. Or I can make a game that really uses your listening habits as, as window dressing, you know, where they, they color what's going on, but they're not, they're not meaningful game tokens. They're not really changing the system. And that's, that's not making a game of your music taste, but it maybe is making a game with your music taste. With is a word I've come to use a lot. And that kind of side-by-side, -side, looser relationship often feels like a way of dealing with that, that very real tension, which is obvious the minute you say it out loud. And, I, and I, again, there are so many people in here who do this awesomely for a living, and I'm super aware that they know this stuff inside out. But, you know, I thought it might be interesting to kind of work through a specific example and see. Thank you. Thank you for a, thank you for a beautiful talk. Um, it sounds like along the way, emotions arose, and uh, as we would expect. And I'm wondering to what degree, at each stage along the way, you thought about what emotions you wanted to convey and what techniques or devices you thought about using to convey those emotions. So the question of, of what em emotions were we trying to instill in our players, I mean, again, you worry about being a jerk and telling you what to feel. But then you also hit this thing that, again, often in the game projects that I make, you, you don't hit of, of kind of having to have an artist statement, of kind of having to go, what am I trying to do with this? And I, I found that scary. Um, and I don't know how well I did. But in the end, what it, what it boiled down to for me was, and I think this project is a quite nice expression for this, is that the thing that I felt I could truthfully say to everyone about Joyce's story is time passes faster than you realize and things happen when you're not looking which doesn't sound like much, but it felt, it felt like an important and universal thing. And so this whole project is about those two things. It's about time passing faster than you realize and things changing when you don't look. And then I leave it up to you to decide how to feel about those phenomena. But without that, one of the reasons we, we, even once we decided not to make a game, we were still lost in the weeds for a while until we doubled down on that. On, on it needed a core. It needed something that we were willing to make an absolute statement about. Otherwise... It was just airy-fairy float. 
I felt like this photograph conveyed a lot of emotion that was suitable to the project, for instance. I mean, this, the work that went into this, I cannot begin to tell. So it was a three-day shoot that did a, a two-year time um, lapse. So we had, we had 11 stunt daffodils. We poisoned <laughs> and then baked those flowers to make it look like they were dying. That tree behind you is a tree that we uh, bust up from 200 miles away. All of those leaves are hand-wired because we shot this in February when there was nothing there. We scouted, I think, 25 locations to find a window that was kind of anonymous but believable and not too sad but could kind of decay. And I, I hope, you know, I mean, that was uh, just wonderful to hear that because I know a huge amount of that came from Lottie and, uh, and Alison and, and the team on that to, to try and convey that. Thank you. Okay, so bear with me because my original question was technically asked, so I had to modify it in line. For sure. Okay, so drawing from the experience that you guys had with uh, trying to work with Dream of a Life, uh, say you were to take from that experience and go towards a fictitious route, where you did say it was easier to consider that, uh, how would you exactly convey the impact of death? I mean, the impact of death is kind of centered around what was done in life and what wasn't done in life and what you were able to experience being taken away from you and never coming back. Or would you guys kind of go through the carnal instinct of survival, just death sucking in general, like nobody wants to die? I mean, I so. think, so how, how, would, how would we approach the, the project yeah. if we didn't have the, the, the documentary core to it? I mean, we've, we've been playing around with that a bit. I think it's really interesting trying to push it out into the lives of the players as much as possible. I'm not really interested in writing a big complex narrative about a fictional character's fictional death. I'm interested in poking everybody out there and seeing what happens. And I think, you know, we, for the Festival of Death, we were looking at kind of... Um, live action Conway uh, game of life variations where your behavior in that simulation was dependent on choices that you made that were maybe reflective of your own life. Um, and I think we looked, now I'm remembering the answer to the previous gentleman's question, you know, we were looking, I've just spent the whole year playing games about death, kind of, but particularly kind of perma or relatively permadeath games, so kind of roguelike things where death is a really big loss and something to fear and not just an instant respawn. Um, and I think there are all kinds of structures there. But I think, I mean, the other kind of really depressing note I could have ended on is that maybe games are the worst place to try and tackle the question of death. I mean, there because is a... we have this weird relationship with death not, not ever being a real thing in games. Well, there, there's an indie game. I don't know if you've heard of it. I can't remember the name of it for the life of me. So anybody here, totally help someone me out. Will, someone will know. Um, it's an indie game where you download it to your PC and literally you just have one chance at it. Uh, one Zach life Stain, to live, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, amazing. I mean, uh, yeah, if I, if I could have come up with that, then I wouldn't have been standing up here looking like an idiot for the last hour. <laughs> so, I mean, I, you know, I think that's fantastic work. But I think it's interesting how, how abstracted that is. I mean, it's what gives it its power. Um, but also how unplayable. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. I've never been brave enough. Have you been brave enough? I've never... I've never actually let it taken that risk. I mean, so this is it. So this is kind of where I am. Is I think there's a ton of interesting stuff to do here, and I think everybody here is in the middle of doing it. I just like giving kind of progress updates. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for the amazing We're over time, so I have to stop, but grab me if you have anything more. And thank you very much for coming.